Good morning and welcome again to our online Sabbath school. Happy Sabbath. Welcome to all of you who have joined us for today's online Bible study. We are so happy that you have joined us for study today. With me today is Karen and I'm going to ask her to say hello. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Natasha, and a happy Sabbath to you all. We have so much in store for you today. And each time, each week at this time, remember that if you are ever unable to join us in the sanctuary, you can join us right here online to watch and learn, but also to ask questions, share your opinions right here in the YouTube chat. So if you are watching on TV, we invite you to grab your phone or tablet and join in the discussion because we want to hear from all of you today. Beautiful. Now, we want to give you a few reminders about our online Bible study. We want you, first of all, to remember that we are here for 50 minutes at this time almost every Sabbath. So if you are watching on TV, we invite you to join your phone or tablet and join in the discussion because we want to hear from you. Karen, could you please start our Bible study with a word of prayer? Sure, let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for another Sabbath day that you have given us, another day that we can come into your courts and praise your holy and matchless name. I ask now that as we go into this study that we will be attentive, Lord, and that we would understand what, you're, what you are saying to us and what your will is for our lives. So, Lord, continue to guide and bless this study. For Christ's sake, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Karen. So, some housekeeping. Remember to have your Bibles and notebooks ready. Follow our study guide online, and you have the link there that you can use for, to get our online study. Or you can request a copy by WhatsApp. And if none of this works, just ask one of the members of our church, any member of the Holder Hill Seventh-day Adventist Church, or any member of any Seventh-day Adventist church. In order to share questions or comments, please log on to YouTube. And if you want us to contact you, you can share your contact information by WhatsApp or again with any member of our church, or you can contact us on Instagram, on Facebook, or by email. So we are gonna be continuing with our quarter study. And this quarter, we're gonna be studying three cosmic messages and in the studies that came before we would have explained what we mean by three cosmic messages for today's study we are looking at lesson number 10 and lesson number 10 is called satan's final deceptions and i am so excited to study this with you so let's say our memory verse I hope you have your Bible study guides open. And our memory verse says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Mm -hmm. And that is taken from John chapter 17, verse 17. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask Karen, Karen, what do you understand by the word truth? Truth means the correct thing. There's no lie in it. It is just the correct thing. Okay. And how did it make you feel? Like when I hear this word truth, I just feel a sense of calm, a sense of well-being, a sense of clarity. And I don't know if a word can evoke that for everybody. How do you feel when you know that something is the absolute truth? To be honest, it makes me feel makes me feel comfortable. It makes me feel confident that whatever is said, using the word again, is the <laughs> truth, is the truth. And I don't have to doubt it. Fantastic. So let's get right into our Bible study. And the first thing we're going to look at is scary deceptions. So we have truth, and then we have the opposite of what is truth. And our Bible study tells us that Jesus has warned us for false Christ and false prophets 
will rise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. And that is taken from Mark chapter 13, verse 22. So let's take a step back and we are going to discuss a little bit who are the elect, because some people may think that elect means that God has a certain set of people that he loves, then another set of people that he doesn't love. But that's not the truth. The elect are simply the persons who have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So it says here in Scary Deceptions that something is happening in the world. Something is happening in our atmosphere. And it says that because of these deceptions, if possible, that Satan would deceive the very elect. Now, we have people all around the world who study the Bible, who have given their lives to Christ, who have given their hearts to Christ, who, have, who love the Lord and who want to follow the Lord. And it says here that our enemy, the devil, that he's so crafty and he's so good at what he does that he could deceive even these people. Could this be a little scary, Karen? Yes, it can be. And, and why it is scary is that the fact that we believe in God, we are following God, but still there's a possibility that persons who are elected can be deceived. You know, it really shows us that daily we need to submit to God and continue to pray and ask him for his guidance. Amen. So let's look at our Bible. In Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, there's a verse that says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. And that means that sometimes we can't even trust our own logic, our own minds, our own hearts, because Satan's deception is really widespread. In our lesson, we are taught that people are often told to follow their own conscience in order to determine for themselves what is right or wrong, or good or evil, and then live accordingly. But the scripture says that we are all sinners, all corrupted. And, you know, when you think about it, it makes sense because there's sometimes that I try so hard to do what's right, but I haven't consulted with God because I think I know what's right. But the Bible is telling us that I can't even trust myself. So I can't trust my own conscience. I can't trust my own logic. I can't trust myself to know what's right or wrong because I am corrupted. So if I trust my own sentiments, this is a guaranteed way of getting something wrong. And a lot of evil has been perpetrated throughout the ages by people who are utterly convinced of the rightness of their cause. So if we look back through history and we see that Christianity has been responsible for a lot of the evils in the world because people were convinced that what they were doing was right. So that is they follow the way that seems right to them. But what the Bible is saying is no, we can't think about this thing. We can't use our logic. We must immerse ourselves in the word of God. And from his word, as we surrender to the Holy Spirit, we learn truth from error. And I want to take a step back into history and look at the example of Saul. Now, he was so convinced that what he was doing was right. He was persecuting the followers of Christ. And th th that is no way in God's word. So he is here and he's doing these things and then God has to stop him in his tracks. But what the Bible is saying is don't, don't trust your own understanding. In fact, there's a verse in the Bible in Proverbs chapter three that it con counsels us not to lean to our own understanding. Instead, we must immerse ourselves in the word of God because Satan has thousands of years of experience in deceiving people. And later on in our study, we're going to look at some of the deceptions. And remember, that's exactly what we're looking at in this quarter, how, what Satan is doing to deceive us. So remember the, the main theme here, we can't trust ourselves, we can't trust our brains, we can't trust our hearts, we must immerse ourselves in the word of God. And we're going to start right now by looking at two texts, and I'm going to ask Karen to read this, these texts for us about what the Bible says about the way that seems right to a man. Karen, could you read for us Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9? 
Sure. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9 reads, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I never thought of my heart of being desperately wicked. I thought I was doing okay. Karen, what do you understand that the heart is desperately wicked? It doesn't even say a little bit wicked. It says that the heart is desperately wicked. What, what does, does that, that mean to you? you? To me, it means that in and of myself, I am wicked. I will do anything. But in order for, for this not to be true for me, I have to depend on God daily. Because in and of myself, I'm just wicked, deceitful, everything that is bad. And do you think that everybody thinks of themselves that way? Or that we should think of ourselves that way as being deceitful, as being wicked, that we can't even trust our own selves? Well, I don't think we should think of ourselves that way. But I, what I do know is that that is just the case. So what we should do daily is strive to, you know, to be more like God, try to do what we can to bring ourselves closer in line with him. Okay, so I'm going to read another set of verses that speaks about the human condition and what the Bible says about us doing things that we think are right. And this comes from Romans chapter 3, verses 9 to 18. And that says, what then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. Oh dear, that's such a hard thing to understand. None righteous, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. And again, this is very hard, even as a Christian to hear, but it's, it's the truth. It's what the Bible says. Their throat is an open tomb. Their, with their tongues, they have practiced deceit. The poison of ass is under their lips whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. And listen to this part. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And this makes me feel so sad that sin has brought us to this level of corruption where the Bible can tell us that there is none righteous, not one of us is righteous, but it also gives me hope because it means that my righteousness is caught up in Jesus Christ, that in order for me to be like God, that I have to hold on desperately and cling to Jesus. And that is something that gives me hope. But let's look at Satan's first light immortality. And we're going to go back to the book of beginnings, which is Genesis chapter three, verses one to four. And I'm going to read it for you. And I hope you have your Bibles open and you're ready to interact with us because this is one lie that a lot of other lies are based on, that a lot of other deception is based on. And this says, now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, and when he says the woman, he's meaning Eve, because remember, we are at the book of beginnings. And the serpent said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, and women out there, if you're listening, don't talk to serpents. It's never a good idea. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Okay, so I have some questions for Karen. And I'm sure she's studied and she's going to be able to answer these questions for us. Karen, where is the lie in, in what we just read? The lie is in the very last section, you will not surely die. So putting that word in there changes the changes the meaning of the sentence. Okay. 
So let's take another step back and look at Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. And I'm going to read it in your hearings because I want you to understand how crafty this deception has been. Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 to 17 says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So let's look back at the, this conversation between the woman and the serpent. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Did God say that she shouldn't touch it? Yes, he said, nor shall you touch it. No, God did not say to the woman not to touch it. God did not add that. If you look at Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2 says, God said to the man, you shall not eat. Oh, yes, yes, you're right. So there's something going on there, even from the beginning, that added to what God said. And that's something that we should not do. What God says, he said, and it's pure and perfect in and of itself. We as human beings are not at liberty to add to it or to subtract from it. God did not tell the woman, nor shall you touch it. So the woman added on a bit to what God said. That, so that's like, all lies are lies, right? But that's like a little lie. And then the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. And what does that mean to you, Karen? Does that mean, is that clear? Does it mean that you may die, but it's not sure? What does that mean to you when the serpent says to the woman, you shall not surely die? Well, I guess if I can put myself in, in his case, I think that the sentence is kind of to confuse her mm -hmm. because it's saying you will not surely die. So I think it's a little confusing but if he said that to me it's saying to me that i surely will not die for sure i will not die okay and thank you for that so here is the the, the deception god says one thing and then the serpent who is satan comes and makes the woman doubt what god says does the woman go back to god and say God, could you clarify this for me? Does she go to her husband? The woman chooses to believe the serpent because the serpent, and I don't know if I was a woman in a garden walking around and the serpent came and spoke to me if I would believe a serpent, but she chose to believe the serpent. And the serpent told her, you will not surely die. So let's look a little bit about how that lie has perpetuated itself through the ages because the Bible tells us that this or describes it as Satan's first light, the light of immortality, that we shall not surely die. And I want to know, Karen, how is this light of natural immortality promoted in various world religions or secular media or even in some Christian churches? All right, well, we see in... Uh... A lot of movies, there's a lot of spiritualism. Mm -hmm. People coming back from the bed, from the dead, sorry, people going to see the dead. And then we also see in churches when they're preaching at funerals where they're saying that this person has now gone to heaven. So those kind of things are the ones which show the natural immorality that's promoted in these various areas. Okay, and I want our viewers not to think about this thing as something that they can't understand. Immortality, the word immortality just goes back to that first slide. 
meaning that you will not surely die. So I want you to think a little bit about any movie that you've watched that people are communicating with dead people or any book that you've read that speaks about, oh, uh, my mother died, but then she came back to visit me and I saw her and we spoke or something like, oh, my father is in heaven watching over me. Um, and this is not referring to your heavenly father. They're probably referring to their earthly father. And what the Bible is telling us is that this is a deception because the Bible gives us very clear instruction about life after death. So let's look and see what the Bible says. So I'm going to read the first text and I'm going to ask Karen to look for Job chapter 19 verses 25 to 27 in the New King James Version. And I'm going to read for you Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 5 and I'm reading from the New King James Version. And this verse says, for the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. So, so if the dead know nothing, it means they cannot know their children, it cannot know where you live. There's, there's nothing there. The Bible actually teaches us that these persons are like in a sleep. So if you remember the story of Lazarus, Lazarus was dead. Lazarus knew nothing until Jesus called him forth out of the tomb. So there is no way that these people could, what these people are seeing could be their mother or father or cousin or loved one who would have died because the Bible teaches us that the dead know nothing and this is taken again from ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 5 and karen can you read for us job chapter 19 verses 25 to 27 yes job chapter 19 verses 25 to 27 reads for i know that my redeemer lives and he shall stand at last on the earth and after my skin is destroyed this i know that in my flesh i shall see god whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. And this gives us so much hope because Job is saying that he knows that at some point his skin will be destroyed, meaning that this physical body that he has will be destroyed. But after all of this happens, he knows that in his flesh, he shall see God. So he's not going to become some spirit floating around or his metaphysical soul will not fly to heaven. He says in Job, he says, in my flesh, I shall see God whom I shall see for myself. And let's take a final look now at 1 Thessalonians. So, no, sorry, I'm going to ask Karen to also look at Revelation chapter 14, verse 13, while I read for our audience 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 to 17. And this says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. So this tells us that there's something wrong with any theory that says anything happens after death other than exactly what is described in the Bible. It says that when the Lord descends, the dead in Christ shall rise first. So even if there were people who were good, who were holy, who were right living people, they're not in heaven. They're currently dead. And what the Bible says is that when the Lord descends, he, that they will be the one that rise first. And then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Okay. Revelation chapter 14, verse 13. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Okay, 
this so is this now is we're in revelation we looked at it at genesis at satan's first deception and now we are in revelation and in revelation john is saying that this, that he heard a voice from heaven saying blessed are the dead who die in the lord from now on that they may rest from their labors so what this is telling us that even in the last book of the bible God continues to guide us about what happens after we die. And it says, the spirit says that they may rest from their labors. So we understand that the Bible is telling us that death is a sleep. Death is a rest. Because when the Lord returns, the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we're going to have another resurrection for those who did not die in Christ. But they are not going to heaven. Their spirits are not floating around. They're not in purgatory. It says that they are at rest. So I hope that that gives us some clarity on what instruction the Bible gives us about what happens to people after they die and how we find our hope. So I want to look at things on a bigger scale because remember we said when we looked at the first lie that Satan builds on this lie. So we have persons who believe, for example, that when you die, you're not at rest, that your soul goes to something called purgatory and you're being tortured there until you pay some indulgences or you do some extra praying and then God releases your soul. Karen, how, what, when you look at the two scenarios, what the Bible says and then what some other religions believe or what some churches believe, I just want to find out which one is more comforting. Is it more comforting or more I don't even know what word to say. Is it better or, or more helpful to believe that your loved one is at rest or they are in purgatory or that their disembodied spirit is floating around somewhere out there? I believe that it's more comforting to know that my family and friends are at rest. And even if we look at our everyday life of course when we are running all over the place it makes us tired and when we are at rest you know we get that opportunity to be comfortable to just relax so i believe that the one that the bible talks about that we are resting until jesus comes again is the more comforting one okay and i want to thank you for that because again the light is being built on so we have lies about purgatory and then we have entire systems of belief based on the light of the immortality of the soul. And I want us to go back to the three cosmic messages because we are looking at all the things that is a part of a system of worship that is not of God. So we see again here that God is saying very specifically what happens after death. And then we have other systems of belief that are adding to what God is saying in the Bible, that are making things up that are not in the Bible. And the Bible describes everything, all systems of worship, which are not in accordance with the word of God as a Babylonian type system. And you would have heard about that as we studied before. And I'm really hoping that you are beginning to understand why the Bible describes it as Babylon, why the Bible goes to such extreme measures, especially in Revelation, to point us back to the truth, to point us back to the study of the Bible, to point us back to the church of God that reads the Bible, understands the Bible, is led by the Holy Spirit, and builds their faith on the word of God. So let's look at Satan's attempt to eliminate the Sabbath. And again, we're looking at another deception. I mean, we're looking at Satan's final deceptions. And there is something for me so interesting about the attack on the Sabbath. And we are Seventh-day Adventists, so we have been brought up in a way that teaches us to honor the Sabbath. And we honor the Sabbath because we understand that this is God's commandment, not because, you know, it's a part of the Jewish system, because the Sabbath came before the Jews. But for the rest of the world, there are very few bodies of belief that actually honor the Sabbath. There are far more people that choose to honor Sunday as a holy day. So let's take a look. And I'm going to read for you Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 16. And it says, So he brought me to the inner core of the Lord's house. And there 
at the door of the temple of the Lord between the porch and the altar were about 25 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east. And they were worshiping the sun toward the east. Now, this, this, this vision that Ezekiel had, and remember, Ezekiel was a contemporary of Daniel. So all of them existed during the time of Babylonian captivity. And God shows Ezekiel this vision that there were men and they were their backs were towards the temple of the Lord and they were worshiping the sun. So Karen, what does this tell you about even during the time of Ezekiel that God was saying was going to happen in the future? So what does this tell you about what God was trying to show Ezekiel would happen in the future? Because remember, you had men and they were by the temple of the Lord. So we're supposed to be worshiping in the temple of the Lord. And their backs were towards the temple of the Lord. So they were back in the temple of the Lord. And their faces were towards the east. And they were worshiping the sun. So they were not worshiping the Lord because their backs were towards the temple. So And they were worshiping the sun. What was God trying to communicate for us, even as far back as Ezekiel, would happen in the future? Right. So it was trying to communicate to us that even in the future, persons would turn their ways against worshiping on God's holy day, even against doing what God says to do, to do our own thing for our own pleasure. Yes. And it's interesting to me that, you know, their backs were towards the temple. The temple signifying the way that God has given us to worship and do not be fooled. God is very specific in his, in his word, how he wants to be worshiped, when the holy day is supposed to be. But here are these persons and they're back in the temple saying to God, we're not going to follow the way that you have told us to worship. We are going to worship the sun. So the, the worship of the sun and the confusion over the day of worship is not something that's new. And I'm going to read for you directly from our Bible study guide about the conversion of Constantine. And Constantine was an emperor and he was a pagan emperor. So when he was converted in the early part of the fourth century, this caused great joy in the Roman Empire. But Emperor Constantine had a strong affinity for sun worship. And don't forget that this was a pagan emperor. So he, he liked sun worship. Edward Gibbon, the renowned historian, writes, the sun was universally celebrated as the invincible guide and protector of Constantine. And this comes from the history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Constantine also passed the first Sunday law. And this is so interesting that we see this even as far back as the fourth century. And I mean, in the Bible, there have been other attempts to eliminate the Sabbath. But here we see the state becoming a part of Satan's plan to eliminate the Sabbath. So this is what the Edict of Constantine said. On the venerable day of the sun, meaning Sunday, let the magistrates and the people residing in the cities rest and let all workshops be closed. This was not a law enforcing Sunday observance for all of Constantine's subjects, but it did strengthen the observance of Sunday in the minds of the Roman population. It was in the succeeding decades that emperors and popes continued through state decrees and church councils to establish Sunday as the singular day of worship, which it remains today for the majority of Christians. And sometimes as I study this lesson and as I read the word of God, I have to sit back and wonder, how did we get where we are? If the Bible specifically gives us instructions on when is the day of worship, how we are supposed to worship God, how do we get to the state where the Sabbath is almost eliminated and there are just a small remnant of people left who are observing the Sabbath? Okay, let's go directly into our Bibles. And we're looking at why Satan is so opposed to the Sabbath. And I want Karen to read for me Exodus chapter 20, verse 11. 
Exodus chapter 20, verse 11 reads, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. And there is so much deception around this particular I mean, all of the commandments, but this particular commandment, there's some people that want to merge um, creation with evolution and say that the six days that the Lord made heaven and earth weren't six actual days. So we don't have to keep the Sabbath. Then we have pe pe persons who are saying that, you know, it's a tradition to worship on Sunday and it's fine because you can worship the Lord on any day. But here in Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, it reminds us that in six days, the Lord made the heaven and the earth and he blessed the seventh day and he hallowed it. And hallowed it means to make it holy. So why would God go through all of this effort to have a particular day that's holy, that's sanctified, that we describe as a cathedral in time? not to have you and you know it's so interesting Karen that the Bible tells us to remember it and this is in Exodus so we have Genesis at the beginning the creation of the Sabbath and then in the book right after God has to give us a commandment to remember the Sabbath and I wanted to ask you Karen what happens when we remember the Sabbath what happens to us when we observe this cathedral in time when we remember we have the opportunity to communion with God. We have the opportunity to worship him in spirit and in truth. So I believe that th this is the day that we should be worshiping. But of course, Satan wants to deceive. He wants us to believe otherwise. So he'll go at knots to help us to believe that this day is not really the day to worship God. And there's something so interesting about how the commandment is written because the commandment could have said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy and leave it there. Right. Um, but in the commandment itself, it gives us one of the first reasons why we should remember the Sabbath day. And it's because God told us to, it says for in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. So this commandment points us to the fact that God is our creator. God spoke this whole world into existence. He created the heavens and the earth and the sea. So where should our loyalty really be? Should it be to the tradition of man that tells you it's okay to, to worship on a different day? Or should it be with the Lord that reminds us every seventh day, every cycle of the week, that it is him that created the heavens and the earth and he created you? and he created me. Therefore, we owe our loyalty ultimately to him. And if the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and he made it holy and he reminds us to keep it, then we should follow the commandments of God. And then in John chapter 14, verse 15, it's a really, really simple verse, which I absolutely love. It says, if you love me, and this is Jesus speaking, keep my commandments. So how can we be Christians? How can we claim to love the Lord and not keep his commandments? So some people say that if we keep the commandments of God, we are being legalistic. If we keep the commandments of God, you know, we are being Old Testament Christians and we are not no longer believing in that we are saved by grace. But we believe that we are saved by grace through faith. And a part of that faith is believing that if God tells us to do something, if God gives us a direct commandment, that we ought to honor it. And the Bible is very clear. If you love the Lord, and we hope that you, our viewing audience, or anybody that is listening, will be on your way to developing a loving relationship with Christ. And I want you to remember this, and this is, keep this in the back of your head. If you love the Lord, you will keep his commandments, because his commandments are not meant to be onerous. It's not meant to be harsh on us or to give us a long list of do's or don'ts. His commandments protect us. 
And the commandment to keep the seventh day also protects us because it reminds us, it points us back to the Lord. It points us back to creation. And it also points us back to the fact that the same Lord that created us is the Lord who died for us, is the Lord who sanctified us, is the Lord who's going to be coming again to receive us. So we looked at two major deceptions, Kieran. We looked at immortality and we looked and we looked at the first lie that Satan told, which is you will not surely die. And the Bible assures us that we will die, except for those who are alive when the Lord returns. We will die. But this death is a rest. We are not floating anywhere. We're not going to heaven. We're not going to hell. We are resting until the return of God. And then we looked at the second deception, the second major deception, why throughout all of the ages, there is this passion of Satan to eliminate the Sabbath when God is very specific in his word that we should keep the Sabbath day holy. So let's look at staying safe from deceptions. So Karen, how knowing how crafty Satan is, how crafty the devil is that he has a doctorate and PhD and any other academic qualification and thousands of years of experience in deceiving people. How can we stay safe from deception? In order for us to stay, to stay safe from deception, we have to bring ourselves more in line with him. We have to continue to read his word, not to believe what others say to us, but read his word and understand it for ourselves. Continue daily to commune with him because Satan is, as, we have been, as we've been saying the entire time, Satan is very crafty. He just did. So one little word to mm -hmm. change a perspective on a whole topic. So we need to really stay close to God and just believe what he says and nothing else. And this means, Karen, that we have to have our Bibles open, that we have to be reading our Bibles and we have to be praying, as you said, so that the Holy Spirit can bring what we would have read back to our minds. So in Revelation chapter 17, the woman identified as spiritual Babylon, dressed in purple and scarlet, rise upon a scarlet colored beast and passes around her wine cup and gets the world drunk with error. And remember in our previous studies, we would have learned that when we say woman, we are referring to churches. So the church identified as spiritual Babylon dressed in purple and scarlet rise upon a scarlet colored beast and she passes around her wine cup and it doesn't say that she gets the evil people or only the people in a particular congregation or country it says she gets the world drunk with error and error has so permeated our society that as we would have said earlier in our study the only hope for us to know and understand the truth the only hope for us to understand what god wants us to do is to read his word and be guided by the holy spirit so that we can understand his word and i'm going to read for you from ezekiel chapter 20 and there are two passages. There's one from verses 18 to 20, and then there's one from verse 10. And I'm going to read Ezekiel chapter 20, verses 18 to 20 first. And it says, But I said to their children in the wilderness, Do not walk in the statutes of, in the statutes of your fathers, nor observe their judgment, nor defile yourselves with their idols. I am the Lord your God walk in my statutes, keep my judgment and do them. Hallow my Sabbaths and they will be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. Karen, do you think that it's interesting even in Ezekiel, and remember Ezekiel was at the time of Babylonian captivity, that the that God is talking about hallowing his Sabbaths. He says, hallow my Sabbaths and they will be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. What does that mean? 
for me, it basically means the, the Sabbath is a sign. So, so what it shows too is that we love God and we are willing to do what it takes to be drawn closer to him, do what it takes to continue to be in commune with him. Okay, so then let's look at verses 10 to 12. And this said, therefore, I made them go out of the land of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness. And I gave them my statutes and showed them my judgment, which if a man does, he shall live by them. And then verse 12, again, is precious. It says, moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. So obedience to the commandments of God is critical for the remnant people of God. And this is not one or two commandments. This is all of the commandments from commandment one to commandment 10, Co starting with, you know, loving the Lord your God, not making graven images of, of anything and worshiping them. And it also includes the observance of the Sabbath. The Bible tells us very specifically and very clearly, if you hallow God's Sabbath, there will be a sign between you and God. So even in Ezekiel, it's talking about a sign so God can recognize or know who our other people can recognize who the people of God are because it's a sign and you may know that I am the Lord your God. So when you keep God's commandments, you are showing the world to whom you belong and who is the Lord who is your Lord and who is your God. And then it says, I also gave them my Sabbath. And again, it is a sign between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. So again, the Sabbath does not only point us back to creation, it points us back to sanctification, which is the process that we go through daily so that in the end, when God comes for his world and he calls us home, we can be sanctified and live with him. So we are about to conclude today's study and we have just a few concluding thoughts. So I'm going to give my concluding thought and then I'm going to ask Karen to give her concluding thought and then we're going to pray and end today's study. So sin is the transgression or the breaking of God's law. The only way anybody can obey the law is through faith in the power of the living Christ. And this description puts things into perspective. It says we are weak, frail, faltering, sinful human beings. By faith, when we accept Christ, his grace atones for our past and empowers our present. He gives us grace and apostleship for obedience. Look at our condition. As strong as some of us think we are, we really are not. Take a look at ourselves and compare ourselves to Christ, and we will see that we are weak, we are frail, we are faltering, and we are sinful. And the only hope for us to walk in the way that God would have us to go is to accept Christ, to understand his word, and to understand his purpose for our life. Karen, what's your concluding thought? My thoughts are God is truth. His word is truth. As our memory verse says, John 17, 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So daily we need to continue to read God's word, which carries all the truth, so we will not be deceived. We are saved by grace through faith, and we need to continue to walk in obedience and please God, our Heavenly Father. So one last appeal. Heaven's appeal to his people in churches, and we are not picking on any church. I don't want anybody to believe that we do not respect them or their church or their systems of belief. But this is heaven's appeal to his people in churches that do not respect and obey the Lord of God. So remember, this is not what we are saying. What we have taught you is what the Bible says. And if you are in a church that does not obey the law of God, as you have seen it presented, as you have understand it in the Bible, heaven's appeal to you is to step out in faith. 
Heaven's appeal to Adventists and Sabbath-keeping congregations is to forsake all self-centered human attempts at obedience and live godly lives by the faith in the grace of Christ. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank everyone for joining us for today's study. I surely had a great time. It was wonderful to be here with you. I want to encourage you to stay on for midday worship. Today's midday worship is going to be wonderful, and we're going to have a wonderful time as we continue to praise God and worship together. Let's end our study today with a word of prayer. Our Lord and our Father, we want to thank you for your word, God, because we understand that your word is truth. Lord, we thank you for the Bible, and we thank you for your Holy Spirit, which guides us into truth. Father, we ask only that today you will continue to illuminate our path, Lord, and show yourself to our brothers and sisters and friends all around the world so that they may know the way in which they should go. Lord, we thank you for this study, and we bless your name. We sanctify your name, and we ask that you will continue to be with us during the Sabbath. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Have a good day, everybody. Wonderful day, everyone. Bye.